Welcome to the first video on syntax. Today we'll start off with the basics. We'll look at structure of sentences, what grammaticality is, and introduce a concept called phrase structure rules, which are very important for creating grammar. So if you've seen the overview video, this first part will be very straightforward, and I have the same example here. In English, we take a sentence like the boy hit the ball, and we talk about word order. We talk about three different things. We talk about subjects, which are the person or the subject we talk about in the sentence. We talk about verbs, and we talk about objects. Now, I hope you guys know what verbs are. Verbs are our action words. So, for instance, the word hit here is a verb, which we label with V. The subject of the sentence is the boy, since we're talking about what the boy did. And the object is the ball. So the boy hit the ball. And we say that English is an SVO language, which means that the word order is subject, verb, object. In the sentence, the crane attacked the young child, we also see subject, verb, object, where the crane is the subject and the child is the object that the crane attacked. Now, not all word orders are the same between languages. In fact, we have a Japanese example here, where when we have a syntactic example, what we have is we have the native language in the first line. We have a rough translation with usually with word features in the second line, and then we have something called the gloss on the last line, which is what it would be translated in our language. So for instance, this Boku wa here means I. In fact, we would normally say it's I dot singular, since we're talking about ourselves. In fact, to say I singular really is a bad translation. It's more like a first person singular word. Then we have Nikuga, which is meat dot, well, this symbolizes the object of the sentence, and the word like. And this translates to I like meat. Now, clearly, the word order if we take a look at the native translation, is not exactly SVO, because we can see that the verb is the last thing in the sentence, the object is the second thing, and the subject is the first thing. So, the word order for Japanese is subject, object, verb. Now, of course, these direct translations and the native, the gloss and everything, the further you go into syntax, the more precise we get. We won't do much of it in this course at all because it's introduction, but if you go into syntax 2 or you take up a higher level course, uh, these glosses will be much, much more important. So I'll cover that if I, if I do a course on it. Now, we should talk about grammaticality. And grammaticality in linguistics is interesting because we say, hey, we're linguistics, we are the study of language, and we're studying English. And what we do as linguists is we look at descriptive grammar, which means that we just look at sentences. And if a native speaker says they can understand it and it sounds grammatical, if it is intuitively grammatical, then we say, okay, it's grammatical and that's okay. So for instance, the sentence, I ain't got no love for Iggy Azalea, that's grammatical. And you're thinking, hold on a second, you said, I ain't got no love. That's not grammatical. No, that is what we call prescriptive grammar. This is what high school teachers teach you. And this sort of grammar is wrong. So a good example is you should never end sentences with a preposition. Well, we know that sentences and prepositions. I mean, a preposition is a fine word to end a sentence with. I just said one, and it's perfectly grammatical. You know what I'm saying? So that is called descriptive grammar, is when we say, you know what? Let's throw out all the rules we want and just take a look at language. And if it sounds grammatical and we understand it, if native speakers understand it, then it is grammatical. Prescriptive grammar is something we don't look at because capitalization, prepositions, all those other things, totally worthless. Have, have you ever, in high school, said, um, 
he likes you and me. And your high school teacher said, hold on a second, this is wrong. This should be the word I, and then realize later in university that, hold on a second, no, it actually should be me. And then you take a linguistics course, and you realize, hold on a second, it doesn't matter, because this is understandable. You can comprehend this, therefore it's grammatical. So, we look at descriptive grammar, because that's just things that native speakers say, you know what, yeah, I understand that, that's fine, that's not awkward, so it's grammatical. So let's do some quick tests here. Uh, is the sentence grammatical? I hit the boy. I, I think it's clearly grammatical. It seems fine. Uh, I don't think there's a single native speaker who would have issues with that. What about my blue tortoise deceived times chocolate? Now, ask yourself this. Does it make sense? The, the answer is no. This question does, or the sentence does not make any sense. It is semantically unsound, so we put a little hashtag there to mean that it doesn't quite make sense. But when you said it, the structure seemed okay. My blue tortoise deceived times chocolate. Yes, my object verbed some other object. It's fine. It's grammatically fine. It just doesn't make sense. So this is one of those examples that is syntactically okay, but maybe semantically wrong. Let's take a look at this. Jimmy not is friendly. Mm, I think any English speaker would say, you know what? I understand it, but it sounds weird. So when it sounds weird, we put a little star there, and we say that's ungrammatical. What about the verb crumpled the milk? Yeah, you know what? When you say it, it doesn't sound odd to say. So we know it's weird in its meaning, so we put a hashtag there, but the structure seems good. Now here's one I just said before, I like to poke fun at you high school teachers. Prepositions are not good to end sentences with. It makes sense, and it sounds perfectly grammatical, so you know what? Yep, totally grammatical. Alright, hopefully you've had enough grammaticality practice. If you're a native speaker of English and something does make sense to you, and your teacher or professor says, no, that's not grammatical, you need to have a talk with her, because a lot of times grammaticality is subjective. Meaning that if someone says something's not grammatical, but you truth, truthfully believe that it's grammatical and you use it in your daily sentence, it probably is grammatical for your dialect. And that's something to distinguish later in the course. But for now, let's talk about generating sentences. Since with all of the grammatical sentences, we've discovered and created a system that can create those sentences from building blocks. So we need to take a look at a few abbreviations here. NP is a noun phrase. So these are phrases that have noun heads. A head is basically the meat and bones of the phrase. Uh, verb phrases here is for VP. So this is a verb phrase. Adj P is adjective phrase. I'm going to not write phrase because I think it's explanatory now. And P is a preposition. We'll be talking about specific words and what these are in the next video. Okay, so noun, verb, adjective, preposition. Okay, that's good. Now, what is a phrase structure rule? Well, we have something on the left and we have some stuff on the right. And we translate this to a tree where what's on the left side of the arrow is the head and every other thing just branches out into a separate path. So here we have a noun phrase, the dog, so let's put this under the NP here, and we have a verb phrase which is ran away, so let's put it under the VP here. So we can see the sentence, the dog ran away, is a sentence, and it generated using this S goes to noun phrase verb phrase rule, since all of our sentences are made up as of noun phrases and verb phrases. So if we take a noun phrase and a verb phrase, we get a sentence. But we can get a little bit more specific, because you saw here in this previous example that we have two words under NP, 
and two words under VP, and essentially we want one word to one node, or one notation, or one symbol. So here, we can get our rules a little bit more specific. A noun phrase goes to a determiner and a noun. So for instance, the dog goes to the, a determiner, and dog, which is a noun. The verb phrase goes to a verb, so this is the verb ran, and then a prepositional phrase. And then this prepositional phrase breaks up into a preposition, so we have a way. We'll be looking at creating more specific trees and more general rules later, but this is an example of how phrase structure rules work. So we don't necessarily have to pick these words. So for instance, let's take a different determiner. So, uh, okay, now pick a random noun. Uh, what about cabbage? Okay, what about a verb that works with a prepositional phrase? Okay, so let's take the word, hmm, left. So a cabbage left. And then this prepositional phrase, we're going to have to extend this a little bit. So a prepositional phrase can also go to a noun phrase. And I can call this the word below. And we can take this noun phrase and put it to a determiner and a noun. So I can say below the house. And this is a modification of our own of our old rule. But it works. A cabbage left below the house doesn't necessarily make that much sense, but it's grammatical, and our phrase structure rules have generated it. I just had to modify it a little bit more for our example. But you can kind of see how you can generate a lot of sentences with this. Now the question is whether this implementation is accurate or not. It's accurate enough for a first level course, so we keep it, but you have to modify it a little bit when you get further. And what's interesting is that these rules can generate an infinite amount of sentences. Our grammar is infinite, and that is something very cool about language. We can create and hear and understand and make sentences we've never heard before. For instance, Charlie Brown didn't attend the University of Nottingham because he was afraid of the deathly cabbages that awaited his arrival on Platform 23 across the street from the Newsbury Mall. That is a sentence I can guarantee you has never ever been spoken before in the history of English, yet it is completely comprehensible and I generated it using the phrase structure rules that supposedly exist in our mind right now. Of course these rules might not be direct, but they are a very good model of what's going on. In fact with two rules here, NP goes to N with an optional prepositional phrase, and a prepositional phrase goes to a preposition with an optional noun phrase. With just these two rules, we can generate an infinite amount of sentences. For instance, I can say student of biology, and we can keep going of, let's say, the student of the biology of horse physics, and we can keep going on and on and on and on forever and ever. We can keep making it longer. It might not make sense, but it's grammatical. So that's a cool application of phrase structure rules. That's pretty much all for it now. Next time we're going to talk about what words are for nouns, verbs, adjectives, prepositions, and how we group them. Now the reason we're not doing trees hardcore right now is because we need to learn how we group the words together properly, and that's called constituency. Once we do constituency, we can go a little bit more in depth with trees, but for now, just intuitively, try to make a sentence or a tree for I left the ball on the counter. In fact, I'm going to do this with you right now. So a great way to do things is to write it all out at the bottom, especially when you're first starting. When you get a little bit better and you're used to trees, you'll start off with the top of the tree and build down. In fact, it's much easier later. But for now, we'll start here. 
So we know that a sentence S is made up of a noun phrase and a verb phrase. And this noun phrase, well, we have this noun I. The verb phrase, we have a V here, so it has to connect all the way up here. And, okay, the ball. Well, we know that the is a determiner, ball is a noun, on is a preposition, the is a determiner, and counter is a noun. Determiners and nouns form noun phrases. So we have two noun phrases here. A preposition and a noun phrase form a prepositional phrase. And I'm not sure exactly how to connect these together, so we'll just say that each of these goes to the VP. I, I do know how to connect these together, I'm saying. From your intuition, perhaps, it makes sense, because we have some arguments. We have left, and we left this thing on this thing. So these are two constituents, and we don't have proof of them yet, but we kind of have an idea of how a structure should look. So that's a good example of what we're going to do. So if you have any questions, as always, leave them in the comments below, and I'll get to them as soon as I possibly can.